Governor Little's priority is education. And like a failed test, his $8,500 idea to help pay for it was given a retake. This time, they tacked on a trailer. It's back. Another bill to remove COVID vaccine requirements for employees made its second appearance at the state house. The Coronavirus Stop Act, which is what happened to it the last time it reached the governor. I know fish and game has been around for a long time, and today that job might be a little safer than it used to be, like when a deputy game warden went missing forever. Today, that warden is being honored twice for his service. Governor Little set the tone for the state of Idaho during his State of the State address. We touched on areas that he thinks we need to improve on as a state. Two of those, workforce development and education. So, Governor Little pitched an idea in his big address, sending graduating high schoolers. He wants them to get grant money to help get them into fields Idaho needs, well, the most, like nursing, welders, technology experts, those kind of things, just to name a few. The idea is called Idaho Launch, and it's a shot at a signature piece of legislation for little and lawmakers that are working through the process to pass it. But in recent weeks, it's kind of run across a couple of bumps in the road. Skeptics, not sure it's a, well, a good idea. Today, a bill was pitched to address concerns to fix Idaho launch in a way where, well, it can hopefully pass legislative approval, according to its supporters. Joe Paris been following this Idaho launch since the, the, its conception. Okay, so what issues do the critics see with this and what are they hoping to fix? Well, Brian, we've heard from Republican lawmakers who say that they appreciate what the idea is trying to do, but they just don't think it's the government's idea or the government's role to really do something like this with this program. So the original plan for Idaho Launch was to send $8,500 to eligible students to help them pay for education or workforce training to get them into career fields that Idaho badly need. Well, pretty quickly after the idea was pitched, critics spoke out saying that there weren't enough parameters on the program and it was a handout to send kids to a broad range of programs and it needed to show that the money would actually end up helping Idaho. So today, a trailer bill, as it's called, it was debated and voted on in committee to add more restrictions, sideboards, to the Idaho launch idea. And so those new ideas go as follow. The new sideboards enhance legislative oversight of the Idaho launch program. It's going to heighten the program's accountability, and it makes sure that lawmakers are getting annual reports on the program to ensure the funding for it is correct and that the Workforce Development Council, who's in charge of the program, that they're operating well and maintaining it. And the Workforce Development Council will be the main group watching the idea. Number two, it ensures that there's greater skin in the game here, and it also makes sure that the maximum grant is $8,000 per student, and that is down from $8,500. So now now, this is a cheaper program than it was pitched earlier in the session. Three, it further limits the use of Idaho launch funds to just tuition and fees. No room and board or school supplies or other other spending options just for tuition and fees. And finally, the sideboards limit the launch program to just community colleges and workforce training providers, universities and other educational opportunities where previously a part of this. So there were critics who said that universities, they shouldn't get a handout from Idaho launch. The focus really needs to be on workforce training, not just general education. I do want to mention, though, there's a carve out specifically in the trailer bill to include the nursing program at Lewis Clark State College. So that is a part of it, and it was highlighted in committee specifically. Now, those community colleges, though, across Idaho, major player in the idea. So how do they feel about the edits to Idaho launch? Gordon Jones, the president of the College of Western Idaho, he told the committee that this is a great idea. He says it addresses a major factor preventing workforce development in Idaho, the affordability for training of those careers. Concern about is this really where I can step forward and see that result? We believe at the community college level that is. This bill lowers that barrier and incentivizes individuals to step into careers, most notably police, fire, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, nurses, um, mechatronics, light robotics, horticulture, you go on and on, and those are just a few of the over 100 programs. So some critics have spoken out asking, is this the role of government? Going to tech school or some sort of post-secondary education institution is a consumer decision. They have products for sale. Product is called an education. If you wish to obtain that education, you have to pay for it. I don't see it as being within government's charter to fund that type of consumer decision. Would the dollars do good? Eh, no argument here. They would. Well, a lot of things would do good, but they fall outside the charter of government. Senator Jim Guthrie pushed back, saying that Idaho, they give a lot of money to schools already. Why stop there? 
Why do we do that? Because we want our next generations to be educated and be prepared to meet the needs of a workforce. So why would we invest those billions of dollars in infrastructure and buildings and facilities and staff and professors and teachers, and then all of a sudden, the product that where it matters the most, which is turning out that student that has the, the skills and the aptitude and the ability to contribute to the workforce and drive Idaho's economy forward, why would we quit there? So We've after two votes, the committee advanced the bill to the full Senate for consideration. It passed five to four. This is a trailer bill that we're talking about. But what about the main Idaho launch bill? Well, that's currently sitting in the 14th order in the Idaho Senate, which means it's waiting amendments that the group could make. So did this trailer bill change that? We'll have to wait and see how the Idaho Senate does kind of take a look at this. They have 10 days to get this done in terms of their, their goal to get out of the session. Sure. March 24th, 10 days away from now. I know that Idaho launch is something the governor's office and leadership for the Republicans were working very closely on and very hard on. I'd be surprised if something like this didn't pass, but we're going to have to keep an eye on it. They don't need to pass something like that to go home. All right, well, the countdown continues. All right, thanks, Joe. You know, yesterday we hit the three-year mark since the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic first hit Idaho. Now in year four, so the novelty of the novel coronavirus has kind of worn off for a lot of people. But the pushback against anything COVID-related, which is anything but novel, continues. Today, the Senate debated Senate Bill 1130, the Coronavirus Stop Act, which would stop any public and private entity from discriminating against anyone not vaccinated against COVID-19. You couldn't be fired for not getting it. You couldn't be required to get one to get hired. You couldn't be stopped from going into any venue or business because you don't have one. This is a redo of a very similar bill from last year, which was called the Coronavirus Pause Act. Now we're going around to stopping it. This time around, they took out the sunset clause and the $1,000 penalty. It would be now enforceable by the attorney general. Well, during today's debate, Republican Senator Ben Adams, the bill's co-sponsor, referenced our founding fathers, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and a shining city on a hill, all of which was centered around liberty, which the senator said we lost during the early days of the pandemic. Our legal system screeched to a halt, allowing for gross despotism by governments across America. Churches were closed by the state. Gatherings were criminalized. For Adams, there's, uh, you need to kind of bring it back to the subject of the bill. Terms like gross despotism make everybody a little itchy. Okay, so. It should make them itchy, Mr. President. Okay, well, in your debate in the future, then, keep it to the bill. Mr. President. Can we go to Mr. President, please go to East. Yeah, kind of moment there. Don't know what they left the chamber to talk about, but they did come back and, well, Senator Adams would come back and talk about the introduction of the COVID vaccine, President Biden's vaccine mandate for companies with more than 100 employees, which happened in November of 2021. An order which was quickly stayed, by the way, by the U.S. Supreme Court and then withdrawn by the president two months later. And it's, that was a decision lauded by the state of Idaho, which joined a lawsuit to prevent such mandates. Senator Adams wasn't the only one to get gaveled today, by the way. In speaking against the bill, Democratic Senator Ron Taylor talked about the decisions regarding masks, social distancing, and vaccines, whatever it took to tamp down the spread of the virus. Decisions made on the fly, he said, in the midst of a whirlwind with the best available expert information. But there was something else that stuck out to him about this bill. You know, we talk about the sacred autonomy of what we can and cannot put in our bodies, yet I watch this body continue to erode the sacred autonomy of people in Idaho. Senator Taylor, objection. that would be uh, out, out of bounds. So, I, uh, I apologize. Um, yeah, Speaker Bedke a little bit, uh, well, not Speaker Bedke anymore, excuse me, Lieutenant Governor Bedke, a little quick with the gavel today. Senator Taylor asked how requiring a vaccine to get a job is different than a negative drug test to get a job. Other senators were unapologetic about their support for this bill, other than to say they're sorry it didn't do more. And that is that I would expand it to include all vaccinations that are authorized under emergency use authorization, because actually these vaccines are, have not been proven to be safe or efficacious for what they propose to treat. Senator Herndon did not reveal a source of his medical information during today's debate. Meanwhile, Democratic Senator James Ruckty felt this bill was anti-business. And so this feels a little bit like we're meeting alleged despotism with despotism. Here we are making a rule which won't be 
temporary from the governor, but will be permanent in nature and will tell our businesses what they can and cannot do. See what Senator Ruckty did there, taking that despotism, hurling it back right at Senator Adams. All right, well, Senate Bill 1130 passed the Senate on a party line vote 28 to 7. It now moves to the House, just like it did last year, almost to the day. On March 15th, it happened. So what happened with last year's bill? Why are we doing this again? Well, after it cleared both chambers, Senate Bill 1381 was vetoed by Governor Brad Little, who said it would have significantly expanded government overreach into the private sector, saying he believes businesses should be left to making decisions about management of their operations and employees with limited interference. The Senate couldn't come up with the votes last year to overturn that veto. So will that change this year? Senator Adams told us today he felt the bill carries a light touch of government, balancing a person's rights and the rights of a business owner. He said this bill doesn't tell businesses what to do, just what they can't do. And he thinks this time on his, well, I guess you should say this time is on his side because it's time that's on his side. Last year, the pandemic was still too, well, novel, too close to it. We still have, well, we now have different information about the pandemic today. We wanted to ask about specifics about that information as well, but Senator Adams was busy on the floor and in committee today. Too busy to connect with us on camera. You know, distance can give us a different perspective, whether that distance is measured in miles or moments in time. Two separate memorials are tracing the steps of an Idaho Fish and Game Warden and adding his legacy to their roster. This summer, Ellsworth Teed will be added to the Idaho Peace Officers Memorials in Meridian and the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C. It's a unique honor for sure for a Fish and Game Warden, too. Made even more unique because he likely died about 90 years ago. So why the honor now? Well, there's a lot to unpack here. Here's Andrew Bartline to do that. Memorials are to remember, but the monumental stories must first be preserved. I actually hadn't heard of him either. In order to be honored. We have a conservation officer that had done, you know, all the research to uh, kind of understand who Teed was, what his story was, what we did and didn't know about him. Born a Clearwater County boy in 1894, Ellsworth Teed turned to Shoshone County to embark on a new career. Maybe the first full-time uh, deputy game warden. It was Wild West. People uh, at that time were more readily committing wildlife crimes, and so he was stepping into uh, some risky situations. A situation highlighted in the press and panhandle lore. So this was on everybody's radar at that time. And it started with what was on Teed's radar in 1934. Unlawful killing of deer was found when they came across three shallow graves that contained the carcasses of the deer killed. Teed left early Tuesday to investigate the poachers. He told his wife he'd be home that afternoon. You know, the fact that he went into the woods on what would appear to be a typical kind of day for him, and that was it. That was all that was known. 
Teed's wife never saw him again, but his car, coat, and lunch were located in Mullen with initial reports of a supposed struggle. There was no specific evidence that was discovered that indicated what had happened, which led to a lot of the speculations. Ah, the speculation. Like the anonymous Spokane man who told the sheriff Teed was walking along a highway from Republic Washington to Canada a month later. Or this one, the Teed had been slain by game poachers. Is that kind of what you guys ran into of trying to figure out what's verified and what's not? It is, and a, and a lot of the stories, if you read through them, there were you know, allusions to hot clues and sightings of Teed that uh, at the time law enforcement didn't really give any weight to based on, on what they knew. Hot clues? Nothing's hotter than that spelling. I think they are the same. I don't know why they chose to spell them that way. We don't know what that hot clue was either. The department makes it clear to carry on the search for Teed until the man is found. So the search team grew to 1,000 people, highlighted with bloodhounds and resources from Washington to Montana. A newspaper in Wallace even called it the greatest manhunt ever conducted in the Coeur d'Alene district. Mines were shutting down so that the workers could go and help with the search. There were, you know, your everyday civilians that were heading into the woods. There was a lot of support and a lot of desire to to find him uh, and, and figure out what happened. So it was kind of a, a thing that brought the community together to try to figure out what happened to Teed. But they never did. Those hot clues turned cold and the $100 reward produced no new direction. The department even appointed a new warden that same year. Do you think we will know what happened at some point? I certainly hope so. Uh, I, I don't know, but I certainly hope so. Idaho Fish and Game is organizing Ellsworth Teed's story to the best of their ability, and that officially landed him in the Idaho Peace Officers Memorial in Meridian. And that ceremony will be on May 18th. That national memorial will also be in May as well. So Fish and Game also told me, Brian, that a new credible source has come forward, and the Shoshone County Sheriff's Office is actually reopening this and looking into this case. So. What? They very recently are getting more information on this, which was something I did not expect to hear today, but that's what they told me when I talked to them. A credible source in a 90-year-old cold case. That's what they said today. How was that? Oh. This was, eight, I think, almost exactly 89 years ago. They're still getting new information on it. Really? Yep. All right. The mystery continues and hopefully solved soon. All right. Thanks, Andrew. All right, smack in the middle of Women's History Month, today is Idaho Women's Day, a day where Idaho women are meant to be celebrated and recognized for their contributions in Idaho and, of course, across the country and even across the world in some cases. Today is also, with a tinge of irony, Equal Pay Day, the day to which women would have to work to equal a salary made by a man the year before. Idaho lands in the bottom five when it comes to equal pay, believe it or not. Anyway, Idaho's Women's Day was proclaimed during the 2020 legislative session. Senate Concurrent Resolution 118 stated March 14th is Idaho Women's Day to acknowledge the influence, impact, and importance of women in Idaho's past, present, and future. So why this day? Why March 14th? Well, that's because back in 1891, the Idaho legislature approved the Idaho State Seal designed by Emma Edwards Green. Yes, a woman. Yeah, and the only seal to be done that way. It's on our state flag. It's also used to notarize documents in the Capitol. And the best part, it's the only state seal, as I said, designed by a woman in the entire country. Pretty progressive Friday though, back then. Back in 1890, Emma Edwards Green entered a contest for the state seal after Idaho just became a state, and the legislature wanted a state seal, of course. Emma's original painting of the seal is stored at the Idaho State Museum and too delicate to display in public, of course. What I think is really fantastic about this whole design is the fact that she placed man and woman on equal footing and equal stature within the design. So to put this all kind of into context, in 1891, which is when she was working on the design itself, conversations about suffrage were happening all over the West. I like the kind of the deer poking its head out behind the seal. Hey, what's going on here? Pretty appropriate for International or for Idaho Women's Day, that is. Yes, because equal footing, right? Again, Idaho is also one of the first states to grant women the right to vote. Emma later wrote, the woman in the painting signifies justice, holding the scales of liberty as denoted by the Liberty Cap and the end of her spear, and equality with man, again, standing by her side. Emma also represented Idaho's industries at the time, including ag, mining, and timber. The elk's head above the shield, because elk and moose were protected at the time. Emma was a trailblazer like many other Idaho women.
We are seeing some inclement weather in some of our mountain areas right now. You can see there is an avalanche warning that's in place for some of our mountain areas. Doesn't extend so far as Fairfield, but areas north of there. However, this is not limited to where the avalanche danger is. It does include the Sun Valley area, and that's according to the Sawtooth Avalanche Center. They have upped their danger rating to, for the for today. It's now in the extreme category, including places like Stanley all the way through Sun Valley. So please be careful if you're going to be in the mountains today. And this is the view from Sun Valley right now you can see visibility very low right now so please be careful if you're hitting the road right now because you won't be able to see too much we're expecting higher rainfall rates as more moisture works its way in and this is the view from bogus basin and you can see just how wet this snow is this sticking to the lens there and it's a very wet heavy snow because temperatures are a little bit warmer and you can even see the trees bending with the weight there uh, in the distance so again we are expecting more snow here's what some of the snow we've stacked up already for the past 24 hours nine inches over at Brundage over in Tamarack and eight for Sun Valley, where again, the visibility is very low. And so we do expect that to continue as we go into the evening tonight, this wet snow continuing in the overnight hours so that between tonight and tomorrow morning, we're expecting two to five inches from tonight in the overnight hours and overnight into the morning, another two to three inches. So a very busy day of weather for our mountain locations. <laughs> All right, we have a winner of the 51st running of the Iditarod. It wasn't our man from Idaho. The grandson of the father of the Iditarod, one of the race founders, pulled into Nome, Alaska this morning with a winning time of 8 days, 21 hours, 13 minutes, and 58 seconds. But the race isn't over. The others still have to make it home to Nome, like Idaho's Jed Stevenson, who is currently in 29th place out of 30. And two others dropped out over the weekend, so that leaves Jed second to last right now, which isn't bad. I know it's not good, but it isn't bad considering it's his first Iditarod. I mean, this year's winner, Ryan Reddington, didn't even finish the race six years that he ran it. He's the first in his family to win it, by the way, despite three generations running the race. So it does take some time sometimes. So let's go, Jed. Let's not finish last in the last great race. And we'll keep you updated as the race continues for Jed over the next couple of days.
All right, this is normally the part of the show where we share your comments you send in during the show. We usually put them up here on the big screen, but we've got some updates happening to our technology right now. Only 9%. Do not turn off that PC. I'll just read them off my phone for today. Very interesting. The legislation concerning the Idaho Launch Act needs oversight, but ESA, the Education Savings Accounts, needs no oversight? I wonder why, asks B&B &B in Nampa. How about this one? Isn't it telling a, isn't telling a business what they can't do a backhanded way of telling them what they can do? do or not, says Tracy and Q in CUNA. We're more progressive in the 1890s than we are today. That one is uh, from Deb, I believe. And finally, now, uh, the 208, thank you very much for your continued exposure of the lunacy that passes for government in Idaho. This would be uh, Walt's words, not mine. But we owe it to you. And we like bringing it to you most times. We'll try to do it again tomorrow. We'll see you then.